Vin Future Prize, a new global science and technology prize for humanity from Vietnam. One Vin Future Grand Prize of $3 million. Three additional special Vin Future Prizes valued at $500,000 each. Vin Future Prize honors science and technology work that creates or has a high potential to create meaningful change in the everyday lives of millions of people. Join us to make a change for a better future. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the third session, Sustainable Infrastructure and Green Transportation Panel within the Science for Life Symposium today. Welcome all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is event in the framework of Vin Future SciTech Week, Vin Future Prize 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, Vin Future Prize is an international prize honoring outstanding scientific achievements and promoting innovations for humanity with participation of world leading scientists, policy makers, leaders of technology corporations and prize laureates to disseminate scientific and technological knowledge to the public and connect generations of young scientists, inventors and entrepreneurs with globally established inventors for potential partnerships. And this event is held with the participation of five distinguished speakers who have excellent expertise and experience in the field of materials and sustainable development. And to come to this event today, we would love to extend our warm welcome to our distinguished guests and the representatives working in the field of science, technology, and government. Let us welcome Mr. Nguyen Anh Duc, General Director of Vietnam Petroleum Institute. Welcome, sir. We are honored to have Professor Sir Richard Henry Friend from University of Cambridge, Chair of the Vin Future Prize Council. We are honored to have Dr. Le Mai Lan, Vice President of Vin Future Foundation. Welcome. And we would love to welcome Dr. Le Tai Ha, Managing Director of Vin Future Foundation. And last but not least, let us welcome Professor Sumitra Dutta from Oxford University, member of Vin Future Prize Council, chair of the symposium today. Welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, and now I would love to focus your attention on the screen so that we can come to the introduction video about our topic today. Video, please. Climate change is having a powerful impact on our environment, threatening food production, worsening air pollution, and destroying homes in extreme weather events. To address these threats and foster a sustainable future, the United Nations Environment Program estimates that countries need to invest up to 300 billion US dollars per year until 2030 and 500 billion US dollars annually until 2050. Especially, these investments are not solely focused on a single country, but also promote global collaboration through efforts like the Just Energy Transition Partnership Program. In conjunction with policies, numerous new green technologies are being innovated, including new materials for energy harvesting and storage, as well as the electrification of transportation. These advancements enable us to reduce carbon emissions and transition to a more sustainable economy. To delve further into these interesting topics, the Vin Future Foundation proudly presents the Sustainable Infrastructure and Green Transportation Symposium during the Vin Future SciTech Week. The chair of the symposium is Professor Somatra Duda, who is the Peter Moores, Dean of the said Business School at the University of Oxford. Also joining the symposium are esteemed panelists, who are prominent figures in material and sustainable development from academia and industry, including Mr. Aki Hizakakimoto, former Chief Technology Officer at Mitsubishi Chemical Corporation, Professor Daniel Kamen, University of California, Berkeley, Senior Advisor for Energy, Climate, and Innovation at the United States Agency for International Development, Professor Sirkostia Novoselov, National University of Singapore and the 2010 Nobel Prize Laureate in Physics, and Professor Tuk Queen Nguyen, Director of Center for Polymers and Organic Solids, University of California, Santa Barbara, under the theme Boundless Unity of the Vin Future Prize Award Ceremony 2023, a new movement is rising, 
a movement that promises to reshape our cities, our lives, and our planet. Welcome to the age of sustainable infrastructure and green transportation. Ladies and gentlemen, so as you can see, the video introduces the topic that we discuss today, including but not limited to the new material and greenification, as well as strategies and regulations supporting sustainability. And now we would love to welcome to the stage Professor Sumitra Dutta, Peter Moore's Dean of the Said Business School at University of Oxford, member of Vin Future Prize Council, and the chair of the today's symposium to deliver the opening speech. Professor, stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I don't know how many of you attended the recently concluded COP meeting, but certainly we all read about it. And sustainability, the climate crisis, is certainly on top of the agenda for almost everyone now. So it's only right that we devote a good amount of time to discuss what are some of the key questions, what are some of the key issues in sustainability going forward. This is a very broad topic, and there are many different facets to discuss. But I'd like to focus our attention on three questions. The first question is about technology. Some years ago, I read a very nice short article in the Guardian magazine, written by two of the original authors of the first IPCC report. And the article was titled, Can Two Wrongs Make a Right? And they basically made the statement in that article that when the first IPCC reports were written, there were some assumptions made in the report. And two key assumptions have proven with hindsight, now looking backwards, to have been wrong. The first assumption was the speed at which the climate crisis would unfold. The assumption was that the climate crisis would unfold at a slower speed than what we are seeing right now. Things are actually becoming worse faster. The second assumption was that at what rate will technology innovate or technology innovations continue? And the assumption was made that the rate of technology innovations would be slower than what actually it has been. So two key assumptions about the rate of the climate degradation and the rate of technology innovations, looking backwards, were wrong. And the question asked was, can two rights make a wrong? Can technology innovation, in fact, help us to address the climate crisis? So that's a very big first question. So we'll hear from some of the guest speakers today and the excellent panel members, what kind of innovations are on the horizon and what hope do they hold for us? The second question is around the social aspects of climate change. Climate change is not a technology phenomenon alone. It affects our lives, it affects the lives of almost every citizen on the planet. As we talk about the next green transition, the emerging green economy, we have to make sure that the new green economy is a better economy than what we have right now. It's a more just, more inclusive economy. How do we actually make that happen? We saw numbers of investments required out here. Who's going to make the investments? How will the benefits of the investments be shared? These are very important questions, and our panel members today will explore these elements also of social justice. So the second question is, how do we build a just, inclusive transition? The third question is around speed and scale. Climate is not isolated to one country or one geography. 
climate is, we have only one common planet, climate affects everyone. And the question really is, we have to address this collectively. We have to do it at scale because it's the whole world. And we have to do it in an agile, fast pace. Why? Because time is running short. All the signals, all the signs out here are that we are running short of time. 2022 was the hottest recorded year in history. And there are other kinds of signs that we can in fact look at. So a number of very important questions and issues. Great panel members to explore them. We'll have a very good time discussing it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sumitra Dutta, for your opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, and now we would love to invite to the stage the one who will present the first presentation for the symposium today. I would love to invite to the stage Professor Sir Kostya Novoselov to be on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for the professor. For your information, Professor Novoselov currently serves as a member of the Bean Future Prize Council and Tan Chin Tuan Centennial Professor at the University of Singapore. And now the stage is your professor. Well, thank you so much. Morning, everyone. So it's really a great pleasure to, to be here. And it's really, uh, I would like to say great thank you to, to the uh, in future for, to, for organizing this session. And it's really bringing the question of the green transportation, but more importantly, the, the infrastructure to the, uh, to the table. Because usually uh, that's something which is, which is being ignored. So we are focusing ourselves on the green production. So that's the kind of picture you, you, usually, you usually look. And so up to now, so we have a fraction of the renewables which, which, we, which we produce and they are in, um, which we use in our economy. And for most people, the, the, the question about sustainability and, uh, and, and, the, and the renewables is simply painting this diagram green and so everything would be, everything would be fine. In fact, the, the situation is by far, far more, uh, more, more, uh, more complex. So you would, uh, so we, of course, we need to color differently the left side of this, of this, uh, of, of this, uh, of this diagram, and that's exactly what, what, what we're doing now. We have to put some investment on the right side, so our, our vehicles need to be uh, sustainable. We need to switch from, the, from petrol to, to, uh, to electric or, or to hydrogen. So uh, uh, our industry needs to be more sustainable. But what is often often forgotten is exactly what uh, Professor Dutta just 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 mentioned. Now is the whole infrastructure in between. So we forget how complex and how elaborative is the transformation, is the transportation, and the adoption of the of the uh, of the energy sources we use we use these days. And uh, I think I would say that quite a lot of investment, at least a third, but maybe even more, would have to go the, into the middle part of this, of, of this diagram if we want to, 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 to switch entirely to the, to the sustainable uh, future. So we have to change the left side of, of the diagram, we have to change the right side, but, but probably more investment would, would, would have to go into the, uh, into the transportation and, and, the, and the adoption of, the, of, of, the, uh, of, of, of our energy. So, uh, and that's why I, um, I'm not that convinced at the moment, and I really hope that it would be the the topic for our for our panel that we have already a winner that 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 we have already the uh, the uh, decisive t technology. So, of course, uh, at the moment, what we have um, uh, been dominated at least the press. I'm not sure the investment actually, but but at least the uh, the the press that electric plus hydrogen hopefully would be would be the 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 solution for the future 
At the same time, there are alternative scenarios as well, and those are being actively developed. And if, if, if we talk about it in terms of the money, so they, I think they are, so those other, other scenarios receive, so receive quite, uh, uh, quite a substantial investments as well. And uh, as you heard from, uh, from, from, from our chairman, so the investments are probably more, uh, are probably more important at, at, at this stage, because if you have to move with uh, any decent speed forward, so you ha it has to be about, about investment. There are also some very alternative scenarios. In principle, no, no one stops you to, uh, con to continue just uh, using the, uh, the, uh, the hydrocarbons and maybe compensate it with the, with the forestry or, so, or, or maybe just growing algae in the, in the ocean. So in principle, if you do some genetic modification, it, it, it could be, it could be, uh, it, it, it could, it would lead you to zero emission as well. It won't be sustainable, of course, because you would still be consuming those uh, those uh, hydrocarbons. But in principle, you can slow down the uh, the the the, the uh, climate change. So that's that's exactly what 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 we need to to consider that the um, uh, the zero emission the the sustainable development is important but the speed with which we are changing is is important as well and that depends not only on the technology but it's also in, it depends on the uh, investments in the in the in the infrastructure which one which scenario is going to is going to win i don't really know i hope that our panel will will discuss it but it definitely needs to tick many many boxes being of course sustainable but 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 but, but being convenient having uh, uh, right right infrastructure on the way so let's just um, very very briefly switch to the um, to the transportation industry and see what what kind of opportunities are there so when we talk about transportation it's not only it's not, it's not only our, uh, our our usual vehicles you use to go to, to work we need to think about tracks we need to think think about uh, about airplanes we need to think about uh, about shipping and um, when we talk about those uh, those things really it's the key the, the key arguments here and, and the key figures are in the in the energy density and uh, if you just if you just lead if you list the energy density you would see that batteries of course they're very uh, attractive for uh, for the for the uh, our everyday vehicles they're not exactly the 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 most attractive from the point of view of the long of the long distance uh, of the long distance uh, transportation so the, there are there are of course com uh, ad, uh, other ways how you can how you can do it so there is the traditional petrol hydrogen is a, is a very is a very competitive t t technology i would say we need to we need to include nuclei I just, it, it's it's a bit difficult to put energy density uh, in terms of uh, for the for the nuclear power power plants but i'm sure that for uh, uh, for some applications we should include nuclear into the in, into discussion as well and then we need to think about infrastructure. So is the, is the production, is the storage, because that, so that's one of the, that's one of the key, one of the key problem. So we need to, so we, we, if, if we produce enough renewables, the big question is how to store this excessive energy and how to balance it. And these days I would say probably hydrogen production is the, is the, uh, from the, from from water electrolysis is probably the most uh, the, the most convenient and 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 realistic way and then if you if you invest into hydrogen production at the at the renewable side maybe you can use it but maybe it's it's easier to to transport it in terms of in terms of hydrogen or 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 or, or ammonia and then you need to think about the infrastructure at the at the charging or at the petrol at the petrol station can we have all the all the variety of those at the same time or in terms of the investment we have to choose one and and we have to focus on one so i would just um i would just say that that's the the uh, 
the, the whole cycle of the sustainable economy is extremely complex and we really need to, to, to look at it in, the, in terms of the cycle rather than solve one piece, one piece at a time. I would like to, just my time is up, I would like to, to finish with a, few, with a few notes that, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a physicist and material science and it's really exciting time to be, to be at the material science at the moment because you, 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 you really have a variety of scenarios starting with the such exotic as, uh, as bioelectrochemistry for, uh, for biological fuel cells, for, for, for example. A lot of work being done on the, on the catalyst and uh, on the catalyst side, both for, uh, for the petrochemical industry, but, but, uh, but even more for the, uh, for the electrochemistry in terms of the, of, the, of the fuel cell, in terms of the electrolysis of water. Seawater electrolysis is becoming extremely important, though extremely challenging task. And then functional membranes, those which we can, those which can separate, but 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 at the same time, which can which can uh, do, do do some catalytic functions uh, on the way. Uh, I think I won't I won't go into the details of the of the particular of the particular uh, of the particular um, uh, materials right now. I just want to say that that people are, are pushing those those boundaries, and the technology is is developing extremely fast. And I think uh, I think uh, we, but again, it needs to, to be taken in the context of the of the of the demand from the transportation from the uh, from the infrastructure as a whole. So I think uh, I will stop here. Thank you so much for your attention, and it's really a great pleasure to participate in this uh, in this panel thank you thank you so much professor Novosolo, with your presentation about the target and route for sustainability ladies and gentlemen in the symposium today we are honored to welcome an impactful scientist professor daniel kamen who currently serve as the James and Catherine Lau Distinguished Professor for Sustainability at the University of California, Berkeley, and member of the Ving Future Prize Council. And now give a round of applause for Professor Daniel Kamen with the second lecture, Transportation, Infrastructure, and Climate Justice. Professor, it's your time. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here, and thanks for both the brilliant introduction to the panel. That's a tough uh, talk to follow, so I'll, I'll do my best. But I think that the key message from this process is that we have an incredibly exciting science and technology base. I'm also a physicist. There may be some uh, trend here. But really, the critical feature now is to accelerate innovation from material science to systems engineering and thinking but to layer in a deep and a, uh, and a sustained role of justice. A colleague of mine at USC um, likes to say that justice must be baked in, not sprinkled on top of these projects. And so what I'll very quickly cover is a little bit of the excitement. My own laboratory gets to work from community groups, nonprofit groups working on individual clean technology solutions to a number of businesses that have taken major leads. Some of them you know of, some big companies, but Virunga Power, for example, a renewable energy company working in the Congo, powering national parks, and, and then a number of national governments where my laboratory has signed individual deployment deals. Because I think that the, the key takeaway from my comments will be, we have a lot of power point. We don't have enough power plant. And that's really the challenge going forward. And we talked yesterday about learning curves, whether you call it Moore's Law, Swanson's Curve, these very, very predictable cost versus production and deployment curves, and whether Moore's Law is tapering out. We heard a, um, a glimpse of that yesterday. Um, but one of the things that has happened, and while we know it scientifically, we have not demonstrated we know it well enough in practice, and those are what my examples today will highlight, is that the cost curve for renewables has transformed the landscape in, in ways in which we are not yet taking advantage. 
So when I started graduate school, solar was the most expensive technology. Now, solar undercuts fossil fuels. It undercuts many of our areas where we're subsidizing fossil energy. And so these so-called learning curves, um, plotted here in linear space, the prior was in log-log space, showing this dramatic trend. Wind onshore, wind offshore, solar, thanks to some of our uh, people will be, uh, will be championing and celebrating uh, to, uh, tomorrow. But this critical path has opened doors that we are not stepping through. So one of these remarkable lessons is that starting sometime in 2021, it is now cheaper to build renewable energy power plants with storage than it is to operate existing fossil plants in many parts of the world, in many regions. That is not fully understood, not just by CEOs of fossil companies, by CEOs of utilities, by people in the research side. That's a transformative tool that we need to take far more advantage of. So when we talk about these learning curves, and now I'm back in log-log space so we can see the dramatic power law for some of the storage technologies, and we have some of the key inventors in the room. Um, and I just want to highlight, oh, if you look at the learning curve, the so-called the slope of that line roughly shows the deployment uh, rate, so a doubling of, for example, lithium ion, the, uh, the blue uh, triangles, about a 20% decline in cost. We need to accelerate that with more innovation in science and technology, but it's deployment. Professor Novoselov highlighted the degree to which infrastructure is about not only technology push, but also about demand pull. And so I'm gonna focus uh, my time on using some of the tools we've now developed to highlight that process. We have developed something that when I started in graduate school was a immature field. Life cycle analysis is now the core of understanding not only the use phase, but the production and the end of use side of our energy technologies. And we need to do that, whether it's hydrogen, whether that is electric vehicles, ammonia, other technologies, they're all there. An example of taking advantage of this change landscape is the so-called duck curve, where as we deploy more and more renewables, we hollow out the, de the net demand curve meaning during the day, more and more solar, in some places, more and more wind, means the net demand goes negative. That's what we want. We want to oversupply with renewables. But the challenge is then, um, to my economics friends, now the marginal value of adding more renewables goes down. That is a death spiral unless you create new opportunities. One of them, of course, is electric vehicles charging up our electric vehicles or making green hydrogen, not some of the other flavors, but green hydrogen, when we have this abundant renewables, whether it's terrestrial based, or I think in a decade we'll likely have space-based solar um, entering the scene, a number of technology options are critical. These give us the chance to think about vehicle to grid issues. Um, these give us chances to think about supplying with green hydrogen making energy for storage, whether it's short-term storage in lithium ion or lithium phosphate batteries, or moving to hydrogen as storage, all of these are opportunities. So I'll rush through in my last three minutes and 27 seconds, a couple examples to highlight places where these synergies are there, we are under deploying them. And one example here is the city of Shenzhen, Southern China, called us up and they said, we want to replace every internal combustion taxi in the city, all 33,000 of them in one year. So what could be better for a physicist with data science friends and colleagues? We worked with the company, um, uh, uh, Build Your Dreams BYD, the local EV manufacturer, the city government, to cut down the charging wait time. And this was at one point the largest EV charging station in the world with 670 charging bays, you can see there's one opening right here. Of course, what do you do when you have a supply issue, you have a desire to do this? What you do is you get your best students to design an app. That's what we did. It rewards taxi drivers that arrive right when their scheduled recharge time happens. We stagger the size of batteries so we don't have a massive queue, people waiting to charge. It improved the revenues for drivers. 
it improved the usage times of the charging bays, and it allowed them to achieve this goal, 32,000 EV taxis deployed in a year. What happened to the retirement of those internal combustion taxis is another question. We also have examples of low-income communities going green. This is a project my state government, California now, the fourth largest economy. We are building eco-blocks. This is a solarized neighborhood where the solar is not powering individual homes or apartments. It's stored in the central battery. It happens to be a flywheel battery. And we then power back to the community with publicly available EV charging bays for shared EVs. And the excess power after that then goes back into the grid in a sales agreement, which is the hardest part of the whole deal. The physics is what I do, but the legal structure so they can sell power back to the utility, that's an area where we need help. And so this eco block is now an example and we're doing it in partners in Paris and elsewhere. An area where I need to thank the VIN group and in particular VIN Fast. this is a VF6 they donated to our laboratory at Berkeley and you'll see around town the electric buses. One of the challenges is charging stations that not only serve affluent riders, but are made available to serve low income riders. And so my last 45 seconds, I'm gonna jump ship a little bit to highlight a new area that pulls things together. One of the projects that I get to direct at USAID, US Agency for National Development, in partnership with our colleagues at GIZ in Germany, is a recognition that every blue dot here is a health facility from the smallest rural clinics to tertiary hospitals. We find that about 100,000 of the 170,000 health facilities in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have electricity or don't have reliable electricity. The black lines are the grid, the dots are the health facilities. I'm just back from projects in Kenya and South Sudan where we are working to deploy in a program called HEDA, solar plus storage or, um, or micro hydro plus storage systems at thousands of these units and to use data science, remote sensors, monitoring to send data back from the small eight kilowatt clinic to this much larger one. This one is in Rwanda. This one is in Eswatini, a 30 kilowatt system. You can see the telecommunications sending information back on the cold chain and at these facilities, now we're deploying electric scooters with swappable batteries to get not only patients, but also medical equipment back and forth to the key centers. So it's an example of an area, infrastructure built from the smallest nodes outward. I know I've gone fast, I just wanted to illustrate many of the different topics where we need to up our game and we need to think big and accelerate this just transition by getting on with the job. So thank you so much for the chance to speak and I look forward to the uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel Kamen. And now it's the time for the second part panel discussion. So I would love to welcome to the stage, Professor Sumitra Dutta, the chair of the symposium today, and Professor Kostya Novoselov. And once again, welcome back to the stage, Professor Daniel Kamen, to come to the panel discussion. And now I would love to welcome and invite to the stage distinguished speakers, Professor Thuk Nguyen Nguyen, co-chair of the Vin Future Prize pre-screening committee, director of the Center for Polymers and Organic Solids at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And welcome to the stage, Mr. Akihisa Kakimoto, member of the Vin Future Prize pre-screening committee and former chief technology officer at Mitsubishi Chemical Corporation. And now it's the turn for Professor Sumitra Dutta to moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Professors Novoselov and Professor Kamen for your wonderful, I think, presentations. I made a few notes about some phrases that you mentioned. I want to come back to them in a second. But before we come to your presentations, I wanted to ask our two new panelists if they had any reactions or any thoughts to what they heard our two guest speakers talk about. So maybe I'll request Professor 
You can just give any reflections or thoughts that you might have had on what you heard. Uh, I think you raised both raised very important points uh, for energy, right? So you're talking about one isolate problem alone of the production or EV vehicle or transportation. So we need to look at the whole picture. And I also would like to add one more point uh, about the social impact of the green energy production. So we're talking about the solar energy and wind, but after 30 year life cycle, right? So what are we going to do with those panel? And so that's another point that I think we should add into the equation to look at the whole picture. And that's something the researcher can think ahead. So if we're talking about material for sustainability and new technology, so we could also think about the recycling aspect now, not waiting until 30 years later or when we have the product out on the market and think about that. Great, great point actually about the whole picture. And we'll come back and explore that because I think Daniel, you also made some comments about how complicated it is to actually change the whole thing. Mr. Akimoto. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel. You know, I'm not a scientist, I'm a businessman. But, but I was very uh, impressed by uh, uh, two of you, your presentation about how you are talking about macro picture, because I, I often talk about macro pictures instead of details. So, and uh, in a short period of time, already you covered most of the important points. You know, for me, I always look at this sustainable future from, uh, from a macro point of view, starting from how you generate uh, renewable uh, energy, how you produce it, how you save energy, uh, what kind of design or product you make it, how your product is used, and how um, the, uh, the waste product is collected, recycled, and how to reduce emission or how to capture emission. So hold this value chain. And if you change one material, that affect all other stages. And we need to look at all these. And in the end, we need to look at the total life cycle assessment. And also very important thing is who pays for these activities and what it, where is the gap. So those are the kind of things I need, I will look at it. And I really appreciate all those, you know, you two covered all, most of the things today. And uh, it was good learning for me too. Please, if you figure out who pays, let us know, okay? <laughs> we're, just, uh, we're only physicists, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, what is important actually in what you mentioned, Mr. Akimoto, is that, Kakimoto, is that uh, the role of business is so critical. In fact, one thing which, for me at least, you know, being in a business school was very evident in the COP meeting discussion, conclusion this time was that the role of business came up, you know, in the climate change very clearly. And so I think it's an important topic we'll try to explore a little bit more. Good. So I just wanted to get your first quick reactions and maybe this will give us a chance to go a little bit more in depth in the comments of uh, our two speakers. So maybe I'll come to you, Professor Novoselo, first. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for it. You made a comment that I thought was interesting. I want to delve a little bit more into. You said we have a winner in terms of winning technology. So my question to you is help us to understand a little bit. Have we solved the technology challenge out here? What is on the horizon? Just, just, just flesh it out a little bit for us. Right. Actually, uh, what I said that we unfortunately think that we have a winner, and I think that uh, that it's still it's still very good, but the uh, the the question is still wide open. So uh, we we have a winner in terms of the energy storage, maybe, but but because it has to be linked to to many other aspects uh, like the production, the transportation, the infrastructure. To my opinion, actually we don't. So I think I think the the next five years are going to be very very exciting for for material science for but 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 also for the whole area of the sustainable technology. We'll have very dramatic few years where several technologies are going to are going to to compete. And as already said, I think is the 
uh, is the first come to do, first pass the the poll. So whomever invests into the infrastructure, the 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 technology is going to is going to win. Even if we limit ourselves, say to 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 lithium batteries, so even there we have quite a quite a leeway. So we can design now. I mean, it's um, um, it should be shameful to uh, to talk uh, about lithium-ion batteries in front of this audience, but um, but just let me show my uh, that uh, how, how ignorant am I? So we, we can design uh, batteries which charge faster but have lower capacity, or which which can which which take more longer time to, to charge but have much much higher capacity so which one do we need to develop and and produce so and then it, it really depends if you uh, if a professor common builds in shenzhen those huge power stations then the winner is the is the uh, slower charges but higher capacity but at the same time we see from uh, same companies in just hundred uh, just few few hundred miles away in in Fujian province CATL is investing into uh, exchangeable batteries then then you would you would you would take a, a different a different metric so to me uh, it, there is a winner in a sense that we that we believe there is a winner but but to, to me the the the, uh, the discussion is still wide open well, that certainly leads a lot of room for innovation and research. So where do you see the frontiers of research? Like if you had to give us a very simple layman's perspective into research in different energy sources, let's say five years, 10 years down the road, what right. do you see happening? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, a physicist who gradually learn electrochemistry step by step, which takes, which takes a, lot, a lot of efforts. And uh, and uh, what I, I think we will focus on is the is the electrochemistry, which covers most of those of those aspects. So we still uh, we're quite um, we're we're quite agnostic to technology, but but we are excited about the the new materials, uh, the electrochemistry, and you when you suddenly find very unusual phenomena. Uh, out of equilibrium uh, processes and so on, but the but those uh, many of those phenomena that can be applied either in uh, electrolysis machines or in the um, uh, in the fuel cells or or in the batteries. Plus, um, the huge advantage and those processes is is basically it's basic. Uh, electrochemistry, which we are still, which we are still researching in terms of uh, new uh, new materials, new catalysts, and and uh, new new membranes, including including functional membranes, and I think so. That's that's the area we need to we need to focus on, and just to show you how interesting is it. Uh, uh, of course, those complex materials, new materials, they really require new approaches to 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 study ai machine learning is of course everyone talks about this only a few groups who are doing this but now uh, uh, big companies big corporations produce a few thousand data points a day uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the new data for new either batteries or electrolysis machines so i think we have very interesting um, candidate for the application of machine learning in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of material science so uh, i think it's it's uh, it's a very good area for scientists but also for technology as well great wonderful professor Nguyen, what kind of comments would you have on the technology evolution what kind of feedback would you have yeah so i believe that it's not one size fit all it really depends on where you are that one type of technology can be better than the other. Like for example, if you talk about you retire a coal plant and, 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 and so what you can do, they have the footprint. For those perhaps energy storage can be, uh, uh, you can use redox flow battery and that requires 
a large footprint. Or in the city mm. crowded or high-rise building, for example, you can have a semi-transparent solar cell window. So you, for those you don't have, if you produce energy locally, you don't have to deal with transportation and the grid issue, right? So I think that we need multiple approaches to, to, to solve the energy challenge and climate change and, and energy storage and generation and transportation. Okay, that's actually an excellent point because every situation is different, every country is different, we have to customize a little bit more. Uh, Professor Cameron, I think I was struck by many comments you made, but one phrase in particular I liked it, which was you said, justice has to be baked in. Do you want to flesh that out a little bit more for us? Uh, so it's a, thanks for the question, and it's a great, and it connects back to recycling and material science and deployment. I think that the, you know, the issue is that as new fields develop or new language develop, this idea of the just transition pushed to a great extent by the climate youth, by the Greta Thunbergs, the Vanessa Nkates, has really resonated with the younger generation that is frustrated that our generation sees this in boxes and silos and doesn't see the replacement of dirty as much as just the addition of green. And we know we need to cut into the fossil footprint, not just add green around the outside. So one of the examples of this pathway of baking justice in is that in California, we required that 35% as a floor, not a ceiling, of our cap and trade revenues must be spent on underserved, fence line marginalized communities. Then candidate for President Biden said, well, I'll do you 5% better. I'll take your justice 35 and I'll make it justice 40. And so now in the US, our largest investment in clean energy in history, the Inflation Reduction Act, fully 40% of that spending, as well as our infrastructure bill, must be spent on marginalized communities. And not just spent willy-nilly, but spent with a quantitative footprint. So we have 26 individual indicators of is this investment truly benefiting justice? That's a hard new lesson because it is not, let's just make batteries better, or let's say lithium ion batteries are great, but lithium phosphate removes cobalt from the equation. And cobalt right now probably has the worst human rights and environmental footprint of any large scale material, except for copper and things we do. So there are opportunities to bake it in, but doing it consistently is an area where we need government, we need private sector to hear the message that we're not restricting your profits, but we're restricting your dirty profits. And so one example is that in California and in Germany, there is now a recycling fee baked into the purchase price of certain technologies. We see no different in consumer behavior. It's actually about $19 per cell phone um, in California. Doesn't change purchasing, but it puts a fund together that can be used to bake justice in. And we need a lot more of those. And the problem is we need to do them fast. We have squandered too many good decades by not deploying fast and not having justice part of that language. Can I check how how happy are you with this federalization of the of the of this sustainability efforts? We, we, of course, we, we uh, if it works, if it if we if we are saving the, the planet, it should be one or countable number of approaches for all. Otherwise, simply the economics is not going to work. And so, California is of course the usual example of. Uh, bringing new new measures to life now you're going even smaller than one california so how are you uh, how do you make sure that you go from one state to another state and the charging station is the same so it took us what 20 years to switch from different charges for for mobile phones to type c so how long is it going to take us in, uh, so this question is a whole course, not a 30 second, but a 30 second version would be what we like to say, not just in California, but in a number of places. We like to say we're the anti Las Vegas. What starts here doesn't stay here. Um, and so what I mean by that is that Kenya has now become a global leader in geothermal power. 94% of Kenyan energy is green. Bangladesh is now the global hub of mesh networks, meaning mini grids are connected to each other 
and they send and they can sell power back and forth. In fact, the Zayed Prize this year was given out for this sole share company in Bangladesh. This mini grid effort I talked about for health clinics is an opportunity to leverage clean energy for health and overbuild those mini grids. And so there's no easy answer to your question because we have to make some choices, but we have examples of doing so. And so one thing that struck me in your slides is that the excitement about hydrogen is real. And while the energy density of hydrogen is hugely high, the challenge of course is that the volumetric density of hydrogen is incredibly low. So unless we have research to companies, to policies, you can get seduced by the high theoretical energy density, but if you don't put it into practice in terms of volumetric density, and hydrogen is difficult on a volumetric basis, we run the risk, I fear, of hydrogen moving into an area where you can argue this will be controversial, where nuclear is today. There's a group of people who think this is the solution, and it might be, but it's got to solve an immediate problem. And right now, hydrogen is not there. We make our hydrogen by reforming natural gas in almost all of the world. That is not a pathway to a green industry. And so I would say leveraging the places that have really taken this on. Green hydrogen, making sure that a company like VinFast, the electric vehicles you make are vehicle to grid compatible, so power can go back. These are challenges that require this whole ecosystem from the business world to our labs to policy. And it's not simple. We're not asking a little bit. We're asking a lot to make this happen at speed and at scale. Dakimo, yeah, please. Um, maybe one comment. Yeah, I think you know, it's very hard to uh, 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 select one scenario. So we need to test uh, various scenarios. In that point, I think Ecotown uh, concept, I mean, Daniel mentioned some of them, is very important. Uh, you know, Toyota uh, is starting a Ubun city. Uh, maybe you may have heard about it uh, on the foot of Mount Fuji in Japan. And it will, uh, I think, operate from uh, 2025. Nobody knows the details, but I'm sure it will be a hybrid of, uh, you know, of course, they have a hybrid car, but uh, also EV, but uh, uh, the, the uh, fuel cells. And so on. And look, look at how those affect each other. And also, that's not only a mobility, but beyond mobility, uh, house and uh, warming uh, of those kind of things included. So I uh, support the idea of eco town in that point. You know. So we are, we're getting into, you are just inventing a new science, experimental economics. So you're just <laughs> doing experiments in the, okay. on the economic scale. Okay. We need to make it not the dismal science anymore. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very interested in learning a little bit more from your perspective of how do we see this on a global basis? So let's take Vietnam as an example, because we are here in Vietnam. And how do you see countries like Vietnam and others, you know, the similar state of development? I mean, how will they react to this opportunity, I would say, and at the same time, a challenge? Uh, so there are a lot of excitement, and uh, I've seen in Vietnam uh, to go with renewable energy, wind and solar. But it's the challenge right now is also the policy is not in place. I read recently a news article regarding of people put solar on their house and they cannot sell it back to the grid, right? And then basically they put in the money to put in the solar module. So they had, need the strong policy in place quickly if you, and, but the country based on talking to, from researcher to, to the, the regular people, they really uh, embrace the idea of going to renewable and green, uh, 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 you know, sustainability. Yeah. And it's not just Vietnam. In California, where we could meet half our average demand with the solar, which is behind the meter on rooftops, a tiny fraction of Californians are allowed to sell power back to the utility. So we have serious institutional barriers and if it's true in Vietnam and in California, you imagine this is a universal problem. Are you sure it's, it's, the, it's institutional in, in Vietnam? I think it's purely economical. If, you, if your economy, if you hope your economy is going to grow into not double digits, but, but close to, to that, can, you, can your technology really uh, feed to this, to this pace? 
Uh, I think that the multi-aspect barriers, and, and, and I, I mentioned one of them, but you are right. Also, in terms of, I know there are a number of uh, places now, companies produce solar module in Vietnam, right? Uh, but also talking to electricity company or, or, or energy company, also the infrastructure and also transportation and storage. So, so that also the barriers here mm -hmm. and to convince company to invest into that also a challenge. And to, to bring back to Dan point about uh, California. So from the day that you put the panel on your rooftop and on the day and to like you connect to the grid and you can use, it took almost a year and that happened to my sister place, right? And to get their approval in order to connect to the grid. So it's, uh, it's everywhere. Yeah, but Vietnam, I think all of this is quite new to, to, to Vietnam. So, so Professor Cameron, how do we cut through this red tape or bureaucracy or lack of leadership vision, whatever you want to call it, to actually get the process moving faster? I think you made the comment about the doors are open, but we're not actually stepping through them. So what can we do? So I think there's no, again, simple answer. So my brother is a professor of regional politics of Southeast Asia at NUS in Singapore, and his, his a mentor wrote a book called Imagine Communities, epistemic communities around topics. So as much as we push in our laboratories on new materials, as much as we get a business case, if the policy door isn't open, we don't get there. And so I think there are a couple interesting versions of this. So again, I'm not gonna use just a California example, but we initially said we wanted a million solar rooftops and we got there basically on schedule. Detractor said it wasn't possible. Then we said we want a million electric vehicles. I said, no way. We hit that over uh, um, ahead of schedule. We've now seen places around the world. Right now they're working on a just transition law in Senegal that would not only benefit you if you install solar, but they actually put the subsidy on storage because they recognize solar has become so cheap in certain areas that it's actually the storage to make the utility more comfortable that they'll have firm 24 seven base load power. Those are examples of areas that lower the, 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 the fear of industrial infrastructure deployers. The problem though, is that this is moving way too slow. So I think one of the aspects is we need to accelerate those lessons so that governments can align. And what we saw, I just came back from the climate conference we saw 2,300 oil and gas lobbyists out of 70,000 attendees at a climate and climate justice focused summit. That is a recipe to go as slow as politics will permit instead of accelerating. And after 28 of these meetings, you know, if this was a business, we would be out the door on the good side and we're not. So Mr. Kakimoto, you represent and I'm afraid to put the business hat on your responsibility out here more explicitly, but what is the role of business in addressing these challenges and how can yeah, we do better? I, I, I mean, uh, surely I'm a private sector uh, 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 plays a very big role in this. But I think, uh, you know, for example, in Japan, it's a big company is too strong and uh, a little bit uh, becoming a bureaucratic. I think private sector that bottom up startup company. I think this ecosystem is very, very important because I think younger people has much more uh, 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 commitment to this uh, sustainable environment. So I think let them do and let them uh, start a company and uh, a big company, older people support money. You know? I think those kind of system is very important. And I think, you know, it's in Japan is now starting, but I think, you know, US is well ahead, but uh, uh, I hope this will change the world. So believe in the young people and let them do start up. That's kind of my point. You no, know, believe in the young people is certainly a very good direction to go, but how do you implement it when the management ranks in many countries and many corporations is, you know, dominated by a different age group yeah i mean we, we support it and also after that may we buy it by, by the company the big companies you know those kind of ecosystem create 
so an example is that a number of countries, Chile is in the lead in this, Kenya is in the lead of this, Malaysia is in the lead in supporting youth innovation forum around clean technology or biodiversity or eco products. But the challenge is that they do have to fit through this narrow eye of the needle to go from, you know, we call it the valley of death or the valley of uh, generational um, keeping the young people down. We've got to find a way to accelerate those channels to get that innovation and get that energy out. So the youth don't just want to sue our generation, which is valid. They want to get on with the business side of clean yeah, energy. Hopefully they'll be done uh, kind of cross, you know, the maybe uh, American people do something with the Vietnamese, French people do with Japanese, you know, different generation. Those kind of cross may, uh, may, uh, kind of create some globalism, you know, that kind no, of there's a lot of room for doing good things. You know, at the COP meeting in Dubai, uh, from my school in Oxford, we held a climate challenge competition for high school students to see what kind of solution they could come up with. And we got more than 600 applications from different parts of the world, more than 40 countries. And the results are phenomenal. Great ideas and great sort of solutions. And we're bringing the winners to Oxford next summer for a summer camp. So it's a very good idea of actually involving getting ideas from them. Well, now the time has come to engage uh, you all, you know, the distinguished audience in the discussion. I think we have some great panel members. And if we can get the lights up in the room a little bit, and hopefully, I think in the previous panels, I saw uh, MC helping get the questions. Thank you, Professor Sumitra Dutta and our beloved panelists. And now it's time for the third part a q and A. It's time for you to raise your questions. And uh, first and foremost, I would love to uh, welcome to this event today, special guest. He is Professor Stanley Whittingham, Director of Northeast Center for Chemical Energy Storage, Binghamton University, State University of New York. And now, he would deliver the questions for the panelists today about the topic of the symposium. So, staff, can you assist our guests with the mic? Could we get the, the microphone mic? to the first row, please? Yes. In the front row. So, Professor, please. A surprise. I wasn't expecting this. Um, I have a, a question about hydrogen storage. Hydrogen is always touted as being very good, but you need a large tank or storage medium, and that re really reduces the um, energy storage ability of hydrogen relative to other things. So you've got any comments about how good can we really get hydrogen storage? Right, so, uh, so the <clears throat> hydrogen storage is, of course, the, the, the key issue when it comes to the, to the uh, transportation, but there was, but let me start from a bit from the uh, from from outside. One 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 problem with the oil industry is, of course, the moment the the way we produce hydrogen, the cheapest way how to produce hydrogen emits a lot of a, a lot of a lot of CO two. Now the, the the all those companies they're looking for ways how to produce hydrogen without CO two emission. It's more expensive. But it's still it's still possible. So, but the the big question for them: if we produce whatever five trillion tons of of of, of hydrogen, we produce twice that amount for in terms of in terms of carbon. So, what what the hell are we going to do with that with that with that carbon? And so, the the the, the there are big efforts in uh, yeah, around the functional carbon materials, uh, the uh, the uh, Carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes, which you can directly use in your in your batteries and so on. So that's a, that's a bit on the on, on hydrogen production. So even there, for me, it's not only green hydrogen. I won't exclude other colors from the equation. But yes, so the uh, the um, uh, the storage is a big issue if we want to have hydrogen uh, hydrogen vehicles, actually, which do exist and which do and which are quite popular say in Korea for example I would say 
uh, uh, hydrogen fuels, how vehicles are on the par with the, with the electric vehicles. So now we have materials which can take six, seven percent of hydrogen by, by weight, and those are, those are based on, uh, on, on cough materials. So that would be, uh, that would be a, a way forward. But at the same time, we have a number of applications where we're not limited by volume. So we have uh, ammonia tankers moving, moving across, the, uh, across the ocean all the time. So uh, if, if, we, if we develop ammonia fuel cells, so that would be a, a big, uh, uh, it would create a big impact on the, on the sustainability uh, on the, on solving sustainability issues, and of course, as the as the uh, intermediate energy storage, which you just need to install next to each of the uh, of the uh, solar cell plant or the or the wind farm, I think there we are not limited by by volume uh, in terms of the environmental being environmentally friendly. I think electrolysis is probably it would be my my favorite rather than installing huge uh, huge lithium batteries which you need to think how to just uh, recycle it, bur uh, it back and, and get and get lithium back so i think uh, hydrogen will play a huge role and uh, and I, I don't have a solution for the for 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 vehicles but there are many many areas where you can use it uh, without thinking about the well, the volumetric density of energy. And we have some exciting opportunities. I mean, you mentioned some of them in your organic materials, the ability to store hydrogen in lattices at higher density than you can think about compressing it. Um, certainly, the rise of the offshore wind industry gives an opportunity to think about selling electricity when the, when the, when the spot price is high. And either making hydrogen or charging up batteries when the, when the price is low. So there are some interesting synergies. Pink hydrogen, nuclear, if nuclear is gonna have this renaissance is certainly one of the areas. Although the temperature for making electricity from conventional nuclear reactors is not the same as you would do for hydrogen. So there's some thermal cycling issues, but these are exciting areas for research. The challenge is, do we get enough deployed by the mid to late 2030s to really impact not just adding green, but reducing the, the thermal, the fossil energy. That really is the challenge that kind of underpins some of this. Thank you, Professor Daniel Kamen and Professor Novoselov, and thank you, Professor Stanley, for your questions. And now it's time for all our delegates and audience. Feel free to ask and raise your hand to raise your questions. So, yes. I see the hand over there. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, if each of the panelists were to have a magic wand, what would be a single thing you would do to get to a sustainable infrastructure and green transportation? Just, you have only one option, please choose. That's a tough one. Who wants to take so it? So never tell a physicist one option, right? <laughs> so this is the Kobayashi Maru scenario that we don't like. If I were to pick one, ironically, it would not be a technical issue. It would be, we need a social cost of carbon that reflects the environmental and human damage. And we need to institute that as broadly as possible. The US government, after a year battle in front of the Supreme Court, has instituted that. The, the social cost of carbon is much higher than the market price anywhere in the world except for Sweden. So it, is a, it would be a market revolution I want all the science and technology to move ahead, but I think if I could only pick one, which I'm gonna resist, it would be social cost of carbon has to be the number that everyone knows, not the number everyone doesn't know. Yeah, let me say from a realistic point of view, uh, you know, CO2 will be discharged anyway. So I think the technology to capture it and utilize it is for me is the most important. Uh, so from CO2 to make a plastic, those kind of technologies, they're most important things for me. Okay, so there are two good suggestions out there. Any others from the panel members? Okay, so we have two good. Yes, Let's thank you, Professor. Question. And next, I, will, I think that we still have one spot left for one question for this Q&A session. So yes, 
Yes, I can see the hand. Yeah, Thank you. Um, I guess if we are, you know, in uh, discussing sustainability, infrastructures, and green transportation, and we are talking about frontier, we should talk more about atomic energy. And uh, so this is, uh, I think, that my remark. I mean, uh, atomic energy, you know, it's far superior, you know, and offer much less problems. And so I think we should not really discard uh, atomic energy. Comments on atomic I mean, energy. I mean, personally, I completely agree. It's, I think it's, it's really shameful that in many countries, this, the, this word is taboo. Thank you so much for breaking the ice in this, in this audience. For me, uh, I was I tried to put it uh, into into the into this story in my slides. I think atomic energy, nuclear power, is really is uh, it shouldn't be excluded from the picture. In fact, uh, I think we will, we if we're really serious about uh, about sustainability, at least in the middle in the, in the middle term, I think it's the it's the solution. So it's the uh, we can employ this faster than anything else, and it uh, it, it would reduce the, especially in in, in countries like like uh, like Vietnam. So we 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 still rely a lot on on coal. It would be the fastest, the most realistic solution. Uh, I think the uh, I'm really happy with the developments of the recent whatever 10 15 years with the uh, with the mini and micro nuclear power plants being be, being developed that's it would uh, allow us to solve this 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 problem in remote in remote areas as well the big question is, is of course the security and in this sense uh, thorium cycle is probably again it's shameful for the humanity that we're really completely disconnected from from that and to my opinion it's purely because of the superpowers playing on the playing their military muscles that that we haven't paid enough enough attention to the to 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 thorium cycle so uh, i would so i would okay maybe i won't use my one wish with the magic wand for the for the nuclear power only but i think it should be important maybe it is it's the uh, the solution for the middle term so as a professor of nuclear engineering i always say i'm rooting hard for nuclear power but it seems to keep getting in its own way in terms of deployment we will see if small modular reactors actually do follow the learning curve if we can manage the back of the cycle i'm rooting for it but it's got to it's got to step up its game and so i worry about this near-term process and billionaires backing their favorite smr companies comes with capital but it also comes with a real worry that billionaires don't follow the rules very well and nuclear is one area where they would need to follow the rules so i am rooting we'll see i do think that one of the areas which may or may not be on uh, on the agenda quickly enough where I'm very excited is, of course, fusion power. And I do like to say uh, frequently that I think, unfortunately, when I'm gone, roughly 2070, I actually think the world will be 70% powered by fusion, but half of it will be 93 million miles away. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel Kamen and Professor Novozolov. And with that, two answers. So the Q&A part coming to an end. Once again, thank you so much for all of your questions from you, and especially the chair and the moderator, Professor Lubich Raduta, and all of our four distinguished panelists. Once again, please give a round of applause for the panelists today. Thank you so much for your discussion. And thank you so much for all of your attendance here and your support with Win Future Prize 2023. And it's now the time for the breakout session for the audience. And our panelists and prominent local scientists in the field to network and connect with each other.
invited guests can join the three different rooms for three assigned topics, and the session will last for one hour and close at 11:15. And last but not least. Please keep in mind that we have been future prize award ceremony, who premiered on BTV One on 20th December 2023. And goodbye. See you again. Thank you so much.